For most of you, it is good afternoon. I'm uh, Steve Parrish. I'm the co-director of the New York Life Center for Retirement Income at the American College of Financial Services. And I wanna thank you for signing in. First, wanna tell you a little bit about uh, what we're covering today, that's always important. And as we look forward to digging out of the effects of the pandemic, the retirement planning landscape has changed quite a bit. So today we wanna get a view from both a vendor company perspective and from a retirement advisor as to this change landscape. Uh, but more than that, we, we really want to talk about communicating, communicating with consumers in what we hope will soon be a post-pandemic world dealing with retirement income. So we have two great uh, speakers today. First of all, we have uh, Dana Ansbach. And um, in addition to being a seasoned uh, professional in the retirement income area, she is also a nationally known speaker on the topic of retirement planning with her most recent work coming in the form of her lecture series on retirement planning and very popular great courses lecture series. I mentioned to Dana that uh, that was the one thing that kind of kept me sane if we'll assume I'm a sane uh, during the pandemic. So it was great to hear that. And then uh, Shri Reddy is Senior Vice President at the Principal Financial Group, who I used to work at a long time ago. And he's really been key to the principal's huge presence in the retirement space. Now, I could spend the rest of the hour singing their praises, but let's make better use of their time by um, letting them talk. So welcome, Dana. Welcome, uh, Shri. And uh, it's uh, it's great to have uh, you two here, uh, Dana and Shri. Um, and let me kind of set up a, a baseline for the, the whole process and where we are currently. We're, we're seeing such a significant change in attitudes as a result of the pandemic. Um, in fact, one of the things I ran into just uh, Friday was a research studies um, done by Greenwald and Associates, a well-known firm, and they called it Rethinking Retirement Survey. Um, their headline basically said that nearly four in 10 say that the pandemic has permanently shifted their vision of retirement. And an aha I got from, from their summary of their research is that one quarter of Americans, uh, worker, American workers who were age 50 to 69 now plan to retire later than they had originally intended because of the pandemic, while another 9% plan to retire sooner than they originally intended. But I think what's really interesting, in both cases, some of the respondents cited that working from home, telecommuting, if you will, as one of the drivers for their changed intention. So some of them are saying, I hate working from home, so I'm gonna retire. Some said, I love working from home, so I'm gonna stay on. So we're really thinking retirement. So let me start with you, Dana. Um, as, you look, as you look at retirement planning in 2021, What's the mood? I mean, I think prospective retirees are worried about social security levels and the prospect of, of increases in um, taxes, but maybe that's too financial. What should retirement uh, advisors be thinking about right now and working with their respective retirees? Yeah, Steve, that's a great question. I mean, I think after the last year, the mood is hopeful. I certainly hope so, at least. Um, you know, there's financial considerations such as increased tax rates and, and the level of security around Social Security. But what you described in that Greenwald study is exactly what I was thinking about. It's like the pandemic, like you put everybody in a snow globe and shook up the snow globe and it's all the same pieces, but they might settle down in a different place. And I think some people are realizing with work from home, they can work longer. And other people are thinking, wow, you know, if this is what retirement is about, just always being in the same place, maybe I don't want to retire. Uh, you know, maybe I want to ex do do continue to work. And, and so it's definitely caused people to rethink things. We've certainly had other people that with all of the, the things going on in the pandemic were like, get me out of this job as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. So you just never know where those pieces are going to land. Where I think advisors need to focus their time is really on the values of your client. So we talk about your money, your values, your plan. And in revisiting those conversations with the client, what has changed. And as planners, I think it's always a struggle not to bring our values to the table and place those on our clients, but instead really figure out what's important to them. So for one person or a couple, you know, maybe working longer, um, 
to achieve a different type of lifestyle and retirement is exactly what they want into the next couple. If you could show them some ways to now live in a, a state that had lower costs and retire sooner, that would be what they want. So really coming back and, and focusing on your client's values. It helps. And let's kind of look at it since you, you deal with them directly, let's deal with it from kind of the vendor and manufacturing area. Uh, Shri, uh, yeah, I just read the white paper from the Longevity Project, which was developed in collaboration with Principal Financial, and I'll post that after the after this event. But one thing that's clear from this paper is that uh, prepared planning doesn't get very far without the tools you need to execute it, whether it's products or services. So let me ask you, at, at uh, the retirement planning environment that we're dealing with right now, what are the the macro considerations and concerns for you at the principal? I mean. What product and service considerations are in the forefront for you right now? Yeah, so, so Steve, first of all, thank you for having me here. And to all the attendees today, thank you for your time this afternoon. I'm going to offer a couple of themes, but before I get into it, let me actually start with my summation of my entire presentation here today. Mm -hmm. Your clients are going to be just fine because this country, the economy, the resources that we possess, the advancements that we have in both technology and innovation, far outpace anything else on the planet. That's point, point one. Point two, they have you. And you're there not only as a financial advisor, but your primary job is to provide the reassurance and comfort and the handholding when people go through uncertain times. And I can't think of a more uncertain volatile period in my time. And this is me and my professional career, having lived through the Asian financial crisis, uh, long-term capital management, uh, the Great Recession, 9-11, all the things that have happened. We're living in really uncertain times and like the, the pandemic, there is no playbook. But that being said, your clients are gonna be okay because of our society, country, and you. Let's talk about the challenges that they're facing now, right? Because they are absolutely unprecedented. People look at things like, well, uh, pent up demand. They look at macro factors. They look at stock market highs and think, well, it seems like things are doing pretty well. Part of the problem with those numbers is they're precisely inaccurate. They tell the story of averages and similar to trying to have your clients save to average life expectancy, it doesn't work because we're all very unique and our situations are very, very different. But a few po points I think are worthwhile to take away from today's conversation. Historically low rates and, and almost a proactive push for inflation. So you're actually sitting with real rates of, real rates of return that are already negative rewarding investors versus savers when we know that only about 52 to 55 percent of the country even participates in equities so you have half of your clients who don't invest at all and maybe they're not your clients and that's why uh clearly there's market highs but some of them are being driven by almost uh, imp improbable reasons such as a retail investor the fear of missing out and one of the stats i thought i'd leave you with before we talk about one other macro factor and that's national debt is the top five stocks today represent roughly 17 to 18% of all US market capitalization. The top 10 stocks are substantially even higher than that. So when you think about the Apples, the Googles, the Facebook, Amazons, it's a significant portion. Now, why I'm, I'm teeing this up is advisors, I think another story we all need to do a better job of articulating is when people invest and they go with passive investments or they follow other retail investors, they probably have much higher concentration risk than we actually give them credit for or help them solve for. So the last item, and I will tee up here, is the national debt. Clearly, when all countries are creating money supply, the U.S. dollar continues to be the risk-free currency, and I think we've been okay. Over time, at some point, you're going to have to address it. So hopefully through Q&A in this conversation, we'll talk about taxes, inflation, uh, retirement planning horizon, and even Social Security. Okay, and uh, let's do one other, and that's um, a, a practical issue as well is mortality and life expectancy since we're talking about retirement. And I mean, I'm, I'm kind of confused where it's all going. So we had those new tables come from uh, the IRS for life expectancy, increasing life expectancy approximately two years. And then yet we've heard about, uh, at least with older ages, life um, mortality is a year earlier now. So what are you hearing? What's, uh, as somebody who deals with these kind of products, what are you hearing about mortality and longevity and whether they really will have an effect on retirement planning going forward? Yeah, great question, Steve. And I think there's probably two or three core layers we can draw here. 
first and foremost, and the slide in front of you is great. I mean, it shows an awareness of improving longevity because longevity is improving, not just at birth, but at key ages of 65, 70, and 75, people are living substantially longer. In fact, what do we know? We know history is taught as longevity improves by a full year for every decade that goes by. So it's a moving target. How do you plan for that? That being said, it's really important to address that longevity is not even either. Very similar to everything else we've talked about, longevity trans is translated to by access to healthcare, your socioeconomic and education grouping, geography of the country you live in, even the occupation you have. So there could be five to six years of substantial variation if you look at any given cohort. What I'll tell you is as much as a pandemic has impacted some tail longevity in older Asian Americans, truth be told, most of the people who were affected had pre-existing conditions. And that's important to consider for a couple of reasons. When you're talking about annuities, other longevity solutions for clients, because of selection bias, most of them are not mortality impaired. They're assuming all individuals are healthy. The second aspect of that is based on uh, some of the mortality gains you're seeing it on the annuity side of the house, life insurers may or may not be seeing the same translation on their book because a lot of the enforce are for younger people who typically have something that is insurable, as an insurable interest. There are some people who, who maintain life insurance throughout their life for tax planning and other reasons, but that is not the bulk of who we're talking about. So what I would encourage all of the advisors on the call today to do is plan for continued improvements in longevity be optimistic that morbidity will also improve, but help your clients plan for the possibility of a really long retirement with the same or worse morbidity. Okay, that, that helps. Well, let's, let's talk about um, retirement uh, literacy now. Um, Dana, when you, um, when you look at what's going on out there as far as dealing with our, our clients, one of the things that the American College we're concerned about is this kind of K recovery, where those who are doing well are maybe even doing better as a result of the pandemic, depending on what they were doing, or at least doing as well. And those who were in jeopardy in the first place are struggling even more. But whether you're doing well or poorly, I guess where I'm going with that is for most consumers, uh, their world's been rocked by the whole thing. So I'm curious at the, at the advisory level, how have you worked with your clients in dealing with the changes wrought by the pandemic, whether, whether good or bad for them personally? I'm thinking about you know, early retirement, changed health or changed portfolio. How, how are you dealing with them on that? Yeah, so you know, We've been really lucky in that our clients have weathered this situation quite well, but it's really having frank conversations with people, I, you know, giving them their choices. I was thinking about this as Sri was talking about, you know, the annuity and longevity solution in terms of, you know, who is it a good fit for? And you need to, to segment your clients. So, you know, I've often said when it comes to, you know, that fear of running out of money is an annuity is a great solution yet, you know, why is it that sometimes we have so much trouble getting people to buy them? And there's particular demographics, those we consider more constrained uh, that could really benefit from these products. And so talking to your clients about these things, even perhaps years in advance, I think can be a good start. We will often start talking to our clients if we think a reverse mortgage is gonna be a good fit a decade ahead of time, just to start planting that seed, get people to open their minds. Uh, if you've had clients on the bottom side of the K who have lost income and lost jobs, it, they're going to have to revisit things. You know, is there a way they can re-career? Um, you know, is, is what, what are their options? And there is no way to sugarcoat it. You know, there are people who have been severely impacted and is going to be somewhat of, of a starting over. There are others who, like I use the snow globe analogy, just, you know, their, their plans have changed and, and so, but they're still going to be okay. And then it's just rearranging the pieces, rearranging their underlying financial pieces to support a later retirement or an earlier retirement. But the best thing is having those frank conversations. Don't shy away from very direct conversations and, and just telling it the way it is. Yeah. Well, and part of it is what they know and what they don't know. And you know, in the last nine years at the American College, we've been lucky that we've done these three retirement literacy surveys. And if they tell us anything, we have this kind of perfect storm going on 
where the fact is that the average consumer is very unaware of some of the major issues they need to be aware of in retirement planning. And yet a lot of them tend to be very confident about their knowledge of that. And that of course is, is not a good mix. Um, so we're just curious if um, you're seeing any change in that because of the, the fear or the scare that was caused by the pandemic. Um, I mean, I, I think of your excellent uh, lecture series I mentioned in great courses, it, it seems to be a favorite with subscribers. Is it possible that consumers are starting to get it? <laughs> I would love to think so. Uh, I, I think there's more media sources available today in terms of podcasts and audiobooks and YouTube videos. And, you know, it used to primarily be you had the mainstream press and, you know, maybe a one financial TV show and in the Wall Street Journal. And now you have so many more options to learn about money, to learn about finance, to learn about retirement. Uh, a lot of the plan, 401k plan providers are providing more and more education. All of those things are helping to move the needle in the right direction. In terms of, you know, changes that we've seen, um, you know, I still see that it, there's often a difference in the demographic, just as there's a difference in longevity based on demographics. People that have less assets and less education sometimes don't understand money as well. And I'll use the example of someone I had, you know, years ago who wanted to retire on $250,000. There's a 20 year age gap between this couple. And they thought that was just a lot of money and enough to provide a, a pretty hefty lifestyle for them. And so it was a big shock for them to see that when I translate that into lifetime income, it didn't stretch as far as they thought. And so what I find is almost the same K shaped where people on the higher demographic seem to come in wanting to know what it is they don't know and really wanting to make sure that they have enough when they do, they want it double and even triple tested. And the people on the lower end of the K um, will often have an idea that the money can go farther or do more than perhaps it really can. So there's still an education gap there that, that has to be overcome between those two demographics. Yes, yeah, so it didn't get cured overnight. Um, Sri, so let's let's think about the haves and the have-nots. And since Principal Financial touches so many companies and so many individuals in the retirement space, how are you addressing the uh, the challenges of the haves and have-nots, uh, particularly when they're often you know gender-based or color-based or community-based? Yeah. So, so Steve, first and foremost, I do a lot of work with policymakers, and one of the things I tell them that I want to make sure this group here today is the retirement system in this country is absolutely working as designed. Now, why can I say that with such conviction and confidence? Because if you look at income replacement ratio, ratios across any of the quintiles or quartiles of income, from the bottom 20% up to the top 20%, the system is working. The bottom 20 to 40% get the vast majority of their income replacement from Social Security. Is it much? No. Are they gonna have a wonderful lifestyle where they're retiring with some of the, the pictures we see in brochures? No but I can't create capital and finances out of thin air. I can only replicate and build off of the base and foundation that they started with, right? So creating a macroeconomic structure where that there, there's higher wages, higher savings, that's a separate issue. What I talk to people about, and I think this is where there's a distinction in tone, I'd encourage our, our audience today to think about this as well. I actually think financial services has done a disservice in the last 30, 40 years in talking to consumers mostly because there's a lot of gloom and doom and a lot of fear marketing. Mm -hmm. And I choose not to do that. And for our company, the voice that we choose to use is you're going to be okay. And the reason I know you're going to be okay is no matter how late you choose to start, it's better than not starting at all. That's point one. Point two, there is no financial model from the Nobel laureates to anyone else that factors into account human resiliency. Human beings make Sp almost spontaneous, immediate choice selection based on their own personal situation and the changing environment around them. No one expects a linear line. That's point two. Point three, spending in retirement is not even. People assume, most of our models assume there's a linear spend uh, function. That's not true. People will typically spend more two or three years into retirement. That spending subsides and comes down in the following years. You now, by the way, once you get to a certain age point, even if you're blessed with good health, your desire to, to spend and travel and consume starts decreasing as well. 
Uh, as my father reminds me, you don't build new habits in your 70s and 80s. So whatever you came into retirement with is what you're sort of going to go through with. So, and the reason I tee that up is I think when you tell them it's going to be okay, you've got a whole bunch of tools that are going to help. You know, by the way, there's one third tool, which I don't think a lot of people factor in. That is the face of retirement is changing. Nobody's going to go off in retirement, not do anything. Mm-hmm. There's incremental ways of monetizing and supplementing your finances if you choose to do so. And many can be done without actually putting physical toil and labor. So as those things deteriorate with age, your mental faculty can still make up some of that gap. Yeah, so a, a positive message. And in following up on positive messages, we have the SECURE Act. So Dana, you know, now that we have the SECURE Act and some of the other things, the CARES Act and the stimulus legislation and the IRS regs with the changes in RMDs, uh, how much of these changes affected retirement strategies uh, for your clients? In other words, these are mainly tax-based. Um, is there increased interest in Roth IRAs and uh, conversions? Um, are they worried about the takeaway of the stretch IRA? I mean, how much does that factor into that positive message that we just heard from Shree? Yeah, you know, I think of this time period that typically starts around age 50 or 55. And now because of the SECURE Act, it goes to age 72 as what I call the retirement planning opportunity zone. There are so many moving parts during that time frame. Your required minimum distributions now are, are not starting until 72. So to me, what the SECURE Act did is it expanded that opportunity zone. And when you ask about interest in Roth IRA conversions, uh, you know, they are one of my favorite tools, Roth IRAs in general. And I, I don't know that there's necessarily expanded interest, but there's certainly an expanded opportunity to use them. So if somebody retires at 60 or 62 or 65 and delays social security, and now their RMDs aren't going to begin till 72, there's this window of time where they could be in a lower tax rate. And that window of time can usually be a great time to do Roth conversions or simply to withdraw from an IRA while you're at a lower tax rate. So I do think it expanded opportunities there. Uh, I've also seen the latest research, um, I just saw it on the Pension Council, Pension Research Council, I can't remember the, the name of it come out, but they were talking about the, the potential to delay RMDs even further. And again, that the main people that that helped were already the higher income, higher net worth households that had legacy goals. And so for the average person, um, you know, where Sri was talking about Social Security replacing already a, a large portion of their income. Income, delaying the RMDs it doesn't have as much impact on them. So again, there's a there's a big difference in how these types of legislation impact different demographics. But uh, overall, I you know I think anything that helps people plan ahead and and have conversations and think about retirement is good. Good, and and let me ask Trivia uh, since you work on the 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 plan sponsor side of it and the SECURE Act. I mean, we always look at what there was on the consumer side, but I'm just curious. I, you know I'm going to ask the question, but I don't know what your answer is going to be, is um, how real are some of the changes that they made uh, with the SECURE Act in terms of MEPs and PEPs and giving more credits on 401ks? Is that actually making a difference? And since I'm asking you that, you might address, since uh, Dana already brought it up, the possibility that there might be a SECURE Act too. Yeah. So, so Steve, I'll tell you, as someone who spent years of his life trying to make some of these retirement legislations pass through, I was hopeful in 18. Many of us didn't see it coming in 19 because it came almost at the last inning. And when it came right before Christmas to be implemented effective January 1, that's not a whole lot of time for any of us to react, right? Then fast forward to March 16th, you have the chilling effect from COVID. So I'll echo what Dana said. Anything that streamlines administration burden, reduces costs, and improves access is a good thing. Now, particularly whether it's MEPS, PEPS, and, and the like, the reality is small employers as defined as less than 500 employees. There are many, many small employers that don't offer a retirement plan. And we know if it's less than 100 employees, I mean, the penetration there is super low. And oh, by the way, the disproportionate number of people who work at smaller employers less than 100 employees are minorities and women the groups that need the access the most in the case of women, because they live longer, typically earn less or not in the workforce as long. So I think 
giving them the tools to say, hey, let's go ahead and have a tool offered to you makes a ton of sense. Uh, I am hopeful that more employers will take advantage of it. I did see for the brief two months leading up to COVID, there was absolutely much more interest from plan sponsors on lifetime income solutions and plan because of the safe harbor provision that wasn't secure. I think people are looking to see what this means, but the fact that it's out there, I think is giving them a comfort to let's at least go and explore what we can do for employees. Uh, I do think secure 2.0 is needed. And whether and it could be whether structural issues such as RMDs, but the one I'm pushing for, and I think we have a long way to go here, is our current social security taxation system doesn't really provide any incentive for people to stay in the workforce after the age of 70, especially if you're paying into the system. And I think if you don't address issues like that, it's going to exacerbate a problem we already have. So I'm really looking forward to having the legislative cha uh, challenges to, to, the, to the words on the slide actually improve access, participation, adequacy, and longevity. Okay, that helps. Well, let's take uh, one of those in particular, annuities. Um, annuities is an investment option. Obviously, that's been liberalized with SECURE Act. Um, has that made a difference in the DC world as far as being offered? And are we seeing QLACs being used more? So, you know, uh, are, are they starting to use annuities as a tool in DC plans now? Uh, no, I think the interest is picking up. This is, uh, and I've been doing this for a long time, and I've said, we, hey, we've thrown a party and we're still waiting for the guests to show up, right? We know it's important. We know why it's a tool that's important for individual investors to solve for. I think it's really hard to communicate that in a DC plan environment, especially when you don't have a holistic picture of their own financial profile or their household. And more importantly, there's usually not an advisor providing education counsel. So what I push for within our own organization is how do you simplify the product structure? How do you make it so saleable and understandable? And how do you actually package it with a, with a QDIA? So there's additional adoption that there's almost an autopilot nature. So people don't have to, to think through all the complexity of decisions. Okay, so same question, Dana, more at the, uh, at the advisor level. Uh, how do you get the idea of annuities across? How do you explain it to them and get them to use it? Yeah, so, you know, I like this analogy of we, we accumulate a lot of stuff as we're saving for retirement, and we end up with accounts here and a 401k there and maybe another one over here. And, you know, you need all of that stuff to work together. You need to align it toward a consistent goal to put all the blocks in a sequence to deliver reliable retirement cash flow. And I think annuities are a piece of that. And I, I love what Shri said. It is hard to communicate. It, you don't see the kind of adoption you would expect to see if people really understood that it protects them from running out of money. But if you can get people to think in terms of covering different risks, and one of those risks is living long in retirement. So rather than putting your all your money in one type of strategy, you know, how do we allocate a portion of it toward this particular risk? And they, maybe we could get better adoption by, by framing it in those terms. Um, the other thing I really like is when I see uh, plan sponsors start to frame assets in terms of the amount of potential income it can provide for you later in retirement. I think that goes a long way toward translating that into something more meaningful for people. But they, th th there's still this idea that um, the annuity is kind of giving up control of what they worked so hard to save. And that really has to be shifted to protecting your cash flow so that you have income for life. And, and I agree with Shri, we, we haven't seen that shift happen. Yeah, and I'm, I'm hoping that the Secure Act's requirement that you uh, do this retirement lifetime retirement income um, statement will help, though it's pretty, it's pretty boiled down, so we'll see where that all goes. Let, let me ask a different one that's an important retirement income issue, and that's, of course, Social Security. And I already have some in the Q&A function, I already have some people asking about that. At the advisor level, how do you explain the, what we've talked about a lot at, in American College, the insecurity of social security? Do you advise people to take a haircut? Do you make it their decision? How do you translate that to the, uh, the person saying, well, what am I going to get from income and social security? Well, that's a loaded question. So, <laughs> you know, we... 
look at, luckily we work with people who are very close to retirement. So in mo most cases, we feel very confident that they're going to get the amount of social security that the system currently says they'll get. There's a couple different ways that we handle it when people think they're not going to get that. Um, one is we can just reduce their projected benefits uh, by 25%. So we'll use 75% of their projected benefit amount if they feel adamant that they want to run their projections without it. But back to, you know, why do we feel confident it will be there? If you go back to 1983, the system was supposedly, you know, months away from being insolvent. And they came out with this fix where they raised the retirement age and they made these changes and it was a 50 year fix. And that gets us to almost, it's about 2032, right? 2033, right where the system is currently projected to, to be in trouble again. And so I think, I mean, hopefully they won't wait till the last few months to make those kinds of changes again. But often that's how the system works until there's really a sense of urgency, um, you, the issue isn't dealt with. So, so we think it will be dealt with and small changes are gonna make it solvent uh, for everyone. Let me ask this and I, I'll, Sri, I'm gonna ask you, you know, there's so much distrust, uh, particularly of institutions, but even sometimes of advisors and you know, people are getting bombarded with all these weird messages in the press and they're uh, frankly news uh, weary, if you will. So at, at your level with the kind of a vendor manufacturer level where you're trying to get all people, this information to people, how do you get the consumer's attention and trust? What kind of things work for getting their attention? I think candor, simple language and transparency work, Steve. Before I get into to this question, I'm looking at the Q&A and looking at some of the chat comments. There are a lot of questions around how do you position annuities? How do you get advisors to use them? How do I think about the expenses and fees associated with them? Let me be very clear. Annuities are not investments. They're not going to cost the same as investments because they don't work that way. They're insurance. By definition of insurance, I've got to collect extra from a whole bunch of people and set aside a reserve for the ones who make a claim. And the reality is people do make a claim. And if you look at most public insurance balance sheets, including our own, you'll realize that these aren't high margin products. The costs are required because you need to distribute them. Commissions that are often laid in annuities, if you look at them over the lifetime of the annuity, is actually a lot less than managed accounts or other comparable products. But oh, by the way, they have a guarantee. So why I want to frame it that way is I'll answer this question now the same way I think advisors should be thinking of this. And this is a question I ask our employees a lot of principal. I ask my kids, I ask my wife, and I ask myself, what is it that we're trying to optimize? What are you trying to drive as an outcome? Is it the biggest balance? Is it the greatest risk, risk adjusted return? Because that's going to give you satisfaction. You can eat that. Is it to lead the largest bequest? Because I promise you, these are not what most clients are thinking about. If you have clients who have more than $5 million, they can pretty much self-insure anything and they're going to be okay. If you have clients who have less than $300,000, you should really think how much you want to put in an annuity because I think they need more liquidity than a lot of other clients to, to bar off sort of the unforeseen circumstances. It's the crux of folks between a 300, I'd say more than $2 million mark, that would be way better off pooling their tail risks so they can make the most of their retirement income, uh, take actually greater market risk and investment risk for the pool, that's sort of their play money, and actually leave bigger bequests and other things behind. You can add your values and advisor doing that by taking all their non-discretionary expenses, taking on Social Security and saying, this is on autopilot. You never have to worry about housing, food, or health care. Everything else, let me tell you how we can maximize and drive what you want to drive to Dana's point around planning. Now, I think you do that by what I just said, right? I mean, you make it simple. You talk to them in a language that they can understand. Don't, over, don't overcomplexify it for them because that's unnecessary. And always go back to what I started with, which is you're going to be okay. Because there's a lot of things that are sort of tilted in your favor already. Yeah, well put. And I will say, um, yes, we have a ton of questions on annuities. So I will commit that uh, we will be addressing that in a future webcast because that does seem to be the hot issue these days. But but Dana, I wanted to ask you, um, you have a, a good visual for how you not only get buy-in, but get the clients to take uh, action. So can you kind of describe how you get them to do what you get them to do? 
Yeah, you know, the focus of our planning is on the issues that you can control. Mm -hmm. And so what I see in the financial press and even a lot of advisors still focus on are the things you can't control. Market returns, this constant discussion around the portfolio and the economy and you know, right now inflation is hot in the news and, and those are all things we can't control. So what we have to do is have the planning levers that we can adjust how much we spend. How do we manage taxes? We can't control tax rates, but how do we make the most of those rates and, and use them to our advantage? The level of investment risk that we're taking. And to some degree, we can control our retirement date. Are we going to work longer? Are we going to earn part-time work in retirement? And then Having that clear goal in mind, I mean, I love what Shri just said in terms of what is the ultimate goal, because it's like a teeter totter. You know, if you want to maximize your current income, then you're not going to be maximizing what you leave to heirs. If you want to maximize future wealth, and that's really the focus when we're 20, 30, 40, it's all around maximizing future wealth. And we try to help people make that mental shift to now it is about creating a reliable paycheck in retirement. And it is a different math problem that you're solving. And so if you're using the same equation that you used while you were accumulating and you're trying to use that to solve what you need for retirement cash flow, it's not going to work as well, or at least it may not. There's not as much certainty that it will, will work as well. So those are the types of tools we like to use. And in terms of Social Security, it's amazing to me that so many people rely on FDIC insurance. And absolutely, you know, that is like the gold seal, and yet they won't rely on Social Security. And if there was a severe problem in our Social Security system, you know, over half of the people who collect Social Security, it is their sole source of cash flow. And what happens if we have a lot of poverty in old age? It does become the government's problem. So when we have a huge issue, they have to create money in some way or another to help that problem. And so that's another one of those reasons why I think, uh, you know, we're not going to see a, a big issue with Social Security because there has to be a way to fund paychecks for people or ultimately it, it comes back on the government. Yeah, yeah. And I think the analogy to the FDIC is a good way of looking at it. Um, let me ask one that I don't want to spend much time on, but I just feel like we have to deal with the issue of um, what we can and can't say to the consumers. So, um, you know, we have to do disclosures. And isn't this my clever way of putting a principal's disclosure in that they have to do? You know, we've got the SEC, DOL, uh, NAIC, and state rules about whether you're going to be um, doing a... Uh, going to be a fiduciary or a best interest or a suitability, all that. Uh, let me first ask Sri at the, at the big company level, how do you deal with 50 different uh, jurisdictions and all their, what are sometimes contradictory laws and regs in, in being able to tell your story? Yeah, it's actually 52 plus the national regulators. You got Puerto Rico and DC, right? So it's, it's, it's a lot of regulation. And at the end of the day, listen, Steve, disclosure, it started off not as a negative regime, right? You want to be transparent to consumers. Problem is when you're as prescriptive as we've been, it creates a whole bunch of disclosure that nobody reads. It's sort of like the fine print when you buy out your home or anything else. And that's not doing people a good service. So when we're having conversations, I often tee up and talk about similar to end consumer, what are you trying to optimize? What's your end goal? How do you want the customer to be served? And what are your concerns as a regulator that's being happy, that's either happening to them or that you want to prevent from happening to them? Mm -hmm. And let's architect a solution around that. And, and one of the things I also tee up is th this is a slow and steady process of education. Years ago, this is almost seven or eight years ago, I had lunch with a state senator whose name I won't mention, who basically got frustrated and said, I don't understand why we don't have X, Y, and Z. That would make it so much easier for our citizenship. And I said, well, sir, I'd love to do that, but it's actually illegal according to your own state laws, yeah. right? So it's actually making sure they have an awareness of when you do X, this actually creates an issue here. And here's how you have to think of them in tandem and make sure that there's conversations happening across regulators. So one that I've been having a lot of lately, a lot of conversations around is this notion of what do we want to do as a nation around 401k access or retirement plan access to the workplace? 
Because here's what I do, what I know will add a lot more administrative burden. That's if each of the 50 states has their own version of a mandatory contribution plan. Could you imagine trying to be an advisor who's an expert in all 50 states and now also trying to understand jurisdictionality based on where the employer is based versus where the business is with employees? I mean, that's a nightmare. And those kinds of things, a lot of the countries that we compete with don't have to deal with because they typically have one national financial regulator. So it's working with them on the front end to do that. And the back end, it's making sure that we're not only compliant with the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law. And this is not just a headline risk. Are we doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do? Because at the end of the day, hey, we've been around for 141 years. I, I'm, I have no doubt we're going to be around for a long time. But I want to be around as a trusted partner. I want to be relevant to the clients we serve. Exactly. And um, Dana, when we were talking about this earlier, you made a good point uh, that uh, the other issue with all this is it just increases the cost of the consumer because whatever you have to do at the advisor level is increasing your cost of doing business. And we all acknowledge that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we have, we're a small firm, but we have clients in 27 states and I actually have employees in four states. And so, you know, it's, it's insane. <laughs> you know, it already is a nightmare in my opinion, you know, what we have to do to stay compliant. And, you know, as an example, we just hired a firm to redo all our compliance documents and we had worked really hard so that they read, not just as a legal disclosure, but also trying to be as descriptive to what we actually do. And of course, as attorneys, they come in and change it back to language that to me just doesn't say much. And so it's just frustrating, you know, to try to meet all these compliance requirements. The language ends up so watered down that it's, is it really even accomplishing the goal of disclosing what it's supposed to be disclosing to the end consumer? So it does increase costs. Ultimately, the more regulations there are, it increased costs. And when I see people wondering why products are so expensive or why financial advisors are so expensive, we spend a lot of time in compliance and a lot of costs that, that has to be borne. Well, I wanna uh, turn it back to the positive uh, with a question for you three and, and one for you, Dana, before we get into some of the questions. But one of the things, and again, I uh, full disclosure, I worked for uh, the principal uh, for 17 years, so I'm very aware of it. And, and they were a very early adopter of some of the technology. Um, how are you embracing technology? How are you using that as a positive in, in working with your uh, plan sponsors and your consumers? I think it'd be a good thing for us to be aware of how you're using it. Yeah, first and foremost, technology is a medium, right? Sometimes we hold it out to be this holy grail and it's not. Uh, I'm a firm believer when it comes to healthcare, personal safety or finances, people are not gonna rely on technology alone. They want to know that there's an accountable human being there who's watching out for them, helping to serve them. That being said, so what do we use technology for? We used to provide real-time access and information, scenario planning and calculators, but they have to be simple enough people actually go through it, not something that's complex that they're going to drop off in. And we use it to provide mass customization of information so it's shown in a relevant, meaningful way to someone. So said differently, Steve, if someone loses their job involuntarily, or they are now disabled and they're going on disability, talking to them about a rollover IRA is probably not the right way to have a conversation because that's not their priority or front of mind. And having that technology and data set to be able to mine that and help them have those conversations, I think go a long way. But to my comment around being a trusted partner before, before you can even earn the right to do the long-term planning, I think you have to be able to answer basic questions for them. Should I take a, a refinance my house right now and pay off my student loans? Should I buy a new car or repair the one I have? There are all sorts of basic questions people don't have access or awareness of where to go to. I mean, Dana started talking about a plethora of information out there and I couldn't agree more, but I sort of I smiled uh, internally, at least for sure, because when I think about all the financial information that's out there, it sort of reminds me of when I go out to, to lunch or dinner with my family, the Cheesecake Factory, yeah. Hundreds of items to the point, I don't know what to pick. I don't know what they're good at. Yeah. And I just end up asking a waiter for a recommendation. Yep. And, and I think that's sort of what we're helping people wade through. And technology is a really useful way of being able to mine data, give them an experience that they're used to everywhere else. Because just because we're in financial services and we have regulation and other burdens, people, one, don't know that. And two, they don't care. All they know is Amazon makes them smile and happy. They want us to do the same. 
So if I can use that as a medium to deliver that while giving them the, the personal guidance advice, we'll do that all day long. Exactly. And speaking of making it uh, something that people can understand, I cannot uh, go to the questions without first, um, excuse me, uh, making a acknowledgement of, uh, I really enjoyed, Dana, your lecture series on how to plan for the perfect retirement in the great courses. And one of the things that you did is you had all these nuggets that you use with your clients to explain uh, complicated things. I'm a professor, I can use fancy words, but you know, as Sri just said, it doesn't mean a lot to the client unless you can really make it clear to them. Could you just share with us a few of the things, some of the analogies, some of the metaphors or ways you use of saying things before we go into the Q&A? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one of them I know that you really enjoyed in the great courses was my analogy of, you know, retirement planning and the general rules of thumb and even a lot of the technology that's out there, which technology is crucial to running a retirement projection. But a lot of times the answer it gives you is, you know, 90% probability of success. And that's like telling someone you're flying from New York to LA and head West. It's like, okay, but the types of questions we get in retirement are around, you know, I need to land a plane on a specific runway at a specific time. Like, where is my first retirement paycheck going to come from? How much should I withhold in taxes? Quarterly tax payments, what are those? How should I make them? When? Why do I have to make them? You know, am I at a risk of audit now? So they're very granular questions. What account do I draw out of? My Roth IRA or this? Which investment should I sell in this account? And, and the technology doesn't get down to that level of detail. So the other analogy I will use a lot, or that you see the vehicles on screen right now, is when we're young, it's often the sports cars, right? Yeah, I don't know how many of people on the on the presentation today used to have pictures of fancy cars on their wall when they were a teenager. We all want these high returns, and we, you know, 20s and 30s, we want to maximize our wealth. And then, you know, you've got the economy car that it's reliable and it's predictable. It's going to have low repair costs. You can drive it for a long time. And then you've got the all-weather vehicle, your Jeep. And, and so when I think about retirement, I think about shifting people's focus to that all-weather vehicle and saying, you know, now's the time where you're going to encounter all types of different terrain and, you know, you, you don't want the fastest car. It's not going for the highest rate of return. It's back to what strategy or set of strategies are going to help you weather all of the different conditions that you might get over retirement. Love it. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And um, it, it seems a good transition to say, um, to be able to do those things, you first have to understand it. When I say you, you as advisors that are listening to this. And so I just want to remind you that our ICP is one of the ways we get there. That's why we do this. That's why we have great people like the two we have on right now to make sure you're equipped so that you can get this to the consumer. Um, so I think what would be appropriate at this point is to go into questions and answers. Um, and while we're doing that, for those of you interested, our next webinar will be May 26th. And it's going to be a fun one in that we're going to be talking about integrating estate planning into retirement planning in this post-pandemic environment, something I'm very interested in because I teach a lot of estate planning. But uh, we have a ton of questions and, and our people have stayed on the line here. So I think the what I'd like to start with for both of you is something we really haven't discussed much is long-term care and not necessarily the insurance, but just talking about it. I've, I've heard um, you talk about it, uh, Dana. So kind of how do you in general discuss that uh, concept with um, your clients and then uh, Sri, any, any comments in, the, in what principal does with that? Yeah, so we use a report that was put together by Vanguard and Mercer. I think it was a 2018 research report. And it does a great job of laying out the, the kind of variation in long-term care costs. I think the stats are about 15% of people might expect costs of 250,000 or more. And then, you know, there's a, another, you know, pretty large segment, I believe it's about 25% of people that um, won't experience any long-term care costs. And then there's everyone in the middle where you might need someone to come into the house to help. You just might need more help around the house with cleaning and yard work and, and keeping up on, on things. And so I think the majority of people are going to fall in, you know, in the middle and be able to bear that cost out of pocket or not 
incur any costs. They may pass suddenly. So what we're really concerned about is that that 15% that that could incur a, a very hefty cost. And then it comes back to demographics. So just as Sri said around, you know, the different demographics of insuring for most households that certainly have over 5 million, you know, even in many cases, over 2 million of financial assets, plus perhaps a paid off home, they're gonna be able to bear that cost uh, out of pocket. And so we then shift the conversation to, to do you want insurance for peace of mind? Mm -hmm. So sometimes there's just that, ah, you know, I just feel better because this risk has been insured. I don't have to think about it now. And Shreya, just since you deal with uh, policymakers and all that, I'm just kind of curious, how do you address the, that's such a huge issue, long-term care, since it's not taking care of Medicare and all the issues to use Medicaid, thoughts? Yeah, well, and, and truth be told, you've got selection bias here as well, right? The people who are buying the insurance oftentimes have family history or other things that, that are creating these thoughts in their head, which creates a self-fulfilling prophecy that premiums go up over time and they're hard to sustain. And there are three or four guiding principles that I'd offer on long-term care. First and foremost, costs are not uniform throughout the country. They have drastic ranges. So talking to your clients about where they want to be, are they willing to move, some of the changes that they can make to help influence those costs and decisions, I think is a big one. The second item that we talk about is people assume long-term care, if you go in, you're going to be there for a really, really long time. That's not true, right? The average long-term care stay is typically less than two years. It's often less than a year because it's the final provision of life. So it's not years and years and years. So you can typically set up a budget for that and you can probably carve out some level of uh, income to help with that, recognizing that if you have, whether it's a, uh, a deeply defined uh, deferred to median annuity, you combine it with social security income, that, that should be able to take care of a good chunk of that cost. But the third guiding principle I offer is if you have married clients, you should really think about how you structure your portfolio so they're both means tested and the surviving spouse who's not in long-term care will be able to take care of themselves. Because I think that's one of those unwarranted consequences that comes out where people have to deplete all their finances before they can get um, uh, Medicaid support. I think that's, that, so there are Medicaid approved annuities that, that are out there that will help the surviving spouse and allow your clients to take advantage of governmental programs for long-term care. So those are three. And, and the last one I'll throw out there is there are lots of hybrid solutions available. They're not all created equal. So make sure you do your research and you understand the trade-offs before you put your clients into them. Very good. Okay. Um, thinking through the limited time we have, uh, again, we are going to make sure we do a, a new session on annuities because we just were flooded with annuity questions. But Dana, let me ask you a question that has come up here and it kind of refer references what several of you did is the non-financial side of retirement. Uh, how do you deal at the, again, at your level with people with the actual issue of retiring? What am I gonna do the day after I hang up uh, the spurs, which as Sri said, most people aren't going to, it's gonna be a transition one, but how do you, how do you deal with that? Yeah, so there's a great book by Fritz. He's, uh, the Retirement Manifesto is his blog. And he wrote a, a little book called Keys, I think it's called Keys to Successful Retirement. And we highly recommend that now for people who are thinking about that shift into retirement, because I think he does such a phenomenal job of talking about what I call the non-financial, the softer side of retirement. We will ask questions, you know, what do you plan on doing? Have you given thought to this? Overwhelmingly, I have seen our clients thrive in retirement. They love it. They uh, were ready. And, uh, you know, I've had, I think, one client I can think of who has gone back to work several times simply because she didn't love it and gets bored. But she doesn't have family and, and grandkids. And so I really think demographics make a big difference. If you have children and grandchildren, a lot of your time is going to be spent traveling and, and being part of the family. And if you don't, and in, in your career has been your primary focus, then you're going to have to give some thought into what's really going to give you meaning in retirement. So I think Fritz's book is a fantastic resource for having those types of conversations and, and even a giveaway to clients who are at that stage. 
I, I think that's excellent. And as a person of a certain age, I just agree that becomes more of an issue than just the financial issue. I really, really want to thank you because this is exactly what I was hoping for is not just what are the issues, but the communication. How do we go about it? And um, I, I really think you've covered it wonderfully. We are going to post um, different information that you talked about, Tree, and that you talked about, Dana. And so there will be plenty of opportunity to do this. Dana, Sri, thank you so much. I really appreciate the wonderful information you provided and all the questions that came from the audience. Steve, thank you for having, uh, having me for sure and Dana as well. And I got to tell you, to all the advisors, you all do yeoman's work. Thank you for keeping your clients uh, on the right path and exhibiting the right behaviors, even through the volatility of this last year. And I'm, I'm entirely certain they're glad you're there. Well, thank you very much. We'll talk to you all in May.